Hello Mzanzi, welcome to episode 373 of the Farmers Inside Track podcast. My name is Duncan Masua and I'm your host for this episode powered by agri Essa Enterprises. Now in this episode, we are joined by Tabo Ulifi, a food security specialist who mentored cohort one of the Farmers in the Women in Farming program. And uh, he's joined by Tola Sibisi, the founder of Ntombi Corner Farming. Now, they discuss the importance of initiatives like the Women in Farming program to promote food security and empower women in agriculture. Tabo, uh, thank you so much for joining uh, Farmers Inside Track. It's definitely great to have you. Thank you very much, Duncan, and thank you to all the uh, agricultural followers. Now, of course, you are a food security specialist, also the mentor of the cohort one farmer in the Women in Farming program. As a mentor, Tabo, for the program, could you share your perspective on the importance of initiatives like this for promoting food security and as well as empowering women in agriculture? Duncan, yes. These initiatives are so very, very important. I'll tell you why. When a plan is thoroughly thought out, it's not just about the theory training. Um, theory training is like planning a game on a chalkboard. You've got to be able to implement it. So when you do the theory training, you've got to look at what's practical on the ground. People can get very carried away in theory and then make it basically impossible to, to implement that on the ground. And with this project, with the different phases, was so well worked out because people think I do food security, I'm a guru. No, I just give two things to people, capacity and confidence. So with Cohort 1, I was doing the theory training. We've been coming together for 18 months now, since mid-2022. We did the theory, but the theory is so aligned to make it easy to transfer that into the practice. And then when the practical comes, your expectations and the realities, then you get a reality check on what is capable. You know, in the classroom, you can think, I can do this. And the moment you're on the field, it's a different ballgame. And that is where, in this program, the mentorship is so important because it gives that confidence to say, look, why do you want to do it like this? And I hear them and they do it. And then I sit back and say, let's see how they're going to go. Why not do it this way? No, they prefer that way. And then we tweak it and so we grow. And it's very much like sheep farming. If you want to go into sheep farming, don't start with 500 sheep. Start with five. If you can go through the whole process of raising those lambs into ewes through the gestation period, the lambing period, and then to the selling period, then you can do it with 50. And if you can do it with 50, you can do it with 100, with 100, 500. And this is why this project is so unbelievably successful, because it's giving capacity. And where we are going now to phase three, it's going to exceptionally enhance, because it's not just that Tabo and Agri-SA enterprises have to do continuously do this. We are now creating the capacity in the communities, and they can then become the mentors to others. It's definitely one of my favorite aspects of the program, that it not only focuses on the farmer self, but you know, the rippling effect that it has on the entire community. And that's what stands out for me about the program. Discuss with us your role in mentoring and supporting the 10 businesses within cohort one of the program. How do you approach building relationships with your mentees and supporting their development? In Sisutu, there are two words, seriti and mokokotlo. And those are integrity and backbone or your spine. A relationship you only build over time. You cannot go in and demand a relationship to be at a certain level. It's something that's organic. It grows. And through the program, the ladies had to write a business plan. I read through the business plans. I saw some of them were very practically implementable and some of them were actually not. And so we went ahead and then started working together on seeing how to get this into reality. And in the process, you give your guidance. And through time, I mean, we started the mentorship in February last year. It's, it's a year now that we've been doing the mentoring on the ground. And the relationships have built tremendously from then to now. It's a something that happens through time and is based on integrity and your ability to have knowledge that the mentees start realizing, but listen, yeah, I should have actually listened to Tabu in the first place and maybe just asked him if we could change it a little bit because it's a bit inconvenient to expect me to harvest on a Sunday because I've got other commitments as well. And then we see how we can work around things like that. Now, of course, we're also joined by Kola Sabisi, founder of Ndombikona Farming and also cohort one participant in the Women in Farming program. It's so lovely chatting with you. Uh, Share with us your journey um, of founding Ndombikona Farming and how it evolved into incorporating a training enterprise within the business. 
So um, just to give you a bit of a background on how Domkuna Farming was founded, it all started uh, by unemployment, to be honest with you. I started off after graduating, not getting work. So then I ended up farming. It wasn't something like I was like truly passionate about, but I ended up falling in love with it once within it. So how I ended up in training, I realized that when I started my own garden, because I was like literally unemployed and doing nothing. So instead of just being like, you know, let me do something. I started noticing that people were really genuinely interested in my garden and people were really genuinely interested in learning how to farm. So I then did a test drive where I wanted to see if there's truly a market or it's just something that I'm thinking about. So I then did a free training for my local community. Now, what I did was it's free. I would provide breakfast and lunch and then I'll train people. However, you needed to give me some sort of motivation as to why should I choose you. The amount of applications that came in, I needed someone to help me with the administration, to be honest, because that's when I realized people love to be trained. People want to know the skill. And so after that, I was like, I found my unique training. And also as a farmer, as an entrepreneur, rather, you always need to have multiple streams of income. You can't always wait until harvesting. So you have to find things to do to bring in income, especially for me, because I've got permanent employees. It was very important for me to have that revenue stream. Not only was it like income for me, but also just providing that skill for me, it just makes me happy. That's definitely inspiring to hear. In the agricultural business, it's hard to succeed in it on your own. You need partners. We need to collaborate with other people. I highlight the role of, of sponsors or supporters in facilitating your transition into agricultural training. How have their contributions impacted your journey? I remember when I originally got the funding, it was just for farming related things, not trading. So when I sent them a proposal and said, hey, I found a new niche or I found something that I'm actually good at that is also impacting our community, giving skills, you know, because right now I have ladies that have gardens that are not planting for profitability, but for sustainability. And I'm so happy to say I taught that person that skill. When I wrote the proposal to them to say, hey, guys, I think I need help. And I want a laptop, I want a printer and stuff like that. I'm sure in their head, they were like, oh my gosh, this is what people do when they get funding. They start thinking they want things for their house. Maybe if she wants to buy a screen so that they can have a new TV at home, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so when I was asking for that, I did a really intensive proposal. And interestingly enough for me, they were like, yeah, sure, go for it, but we're hoping that you're not just wanting to buy new TV, you know, new furniture at all. And the sponsors, Momenta Metropolitan Foundation, with the help of Agri Enterprises and my mentor, Tabo, they really helped me secure this new thing that I want to venture into. And, and I'm growing very well. And I'm having a training at the end of this month in collaboration with another lady that's also been doing trainings for years now. So I can just say that the sponsors played a great role because I think buying these things, I bought it on Black Friday, but it was still expensive. So you can imagine how much money I needed to fundraise before actually entering the spaces of trading. So they really helped me. They met me halfway and made my work a bit easier. Tabo, I spoke to some of South Africa's top young farmers recently asking them, you know, what are currently some of the things that they need as a farmer and as a business owner and Almost all of them highlighted not only just technology, but also market access. How do you work with the farmers to market their produce, the produce that they are growing? Are there any specific strategies or channels that have been particularly successful? Duncan, first and foremost, a food security activist. And food security, people think the supermarket full of food is food security. Now that's food availability. Food security is when the poorest of the poor can have access to food. So at the beginning of the project, there was a lot of hype put on to takeoff agreements, takeoff agreements, takeoff agreements. A lot of the business proposals were based on takeoff agreements. They're going to see SPA and Woolworths and the fresh produce market, etc. 
And what does it help you grow food in Ntebisweni village? And you are selling it to the Durban fresh produce market. The people in Ntebisweni are not having access to your food. So we did the exercise. Look, I've been here. So I said, right, let's go see what you can sell your spinach for at the Durban fresh produce market. And they were lucky they would get at least 30% of what the end product would cost in the shop. And I said, but now look at your community. They come to you. You take out the distribution costs by selling to your community. And they are prepared to pay for your fresh produce right there from the field. And we did an exercise with one of the groups, Amy Sebe in Marion Hill. And they ended up selling all their produce daily as a word of mouth spread. People would come with their own vehicles and buy for their little tuck shop, which is about two kilometers away. And they were making good profitability. You've got to be viable and you've got to be sustainable. It doesn't help you give your stuff away. If you're on a very big commercial scale, yes, you can sell a bushel of spinach for five rand and then the shops will sell it for 10 or 12 rand or 15 rand. But as a small scale operator, you cannot afford to sell it for five rand. You still got to pay for your transport to the off takey, the person that's taking the stock from you. Where the need is in the community and they want to buy fresh and you can give them a good discount and still make much more money than bulk the dropping them off at the supposed off-take agreement signatories. So that is a practical deviation that's really worked out. And some of these ladies are so sharp that when they do end up going to the market, they're actually buying from the market to add on. So they're insourcing certain things that are not growing to be able to give a better service to their local community. And also processing. Processing is also coming to the gate where instead of selling a head of cabbage, they'll cut up the cabbage and add in the carrots, etc., and make little hampers and sell that off to the customers. And it supports their business and they are profitable and viable. And imagine just if you then double your growth. If you are now growing on 3,000 squares and you can double it up to 6,000, your costs do not double, but your turnover more than doubles. This is the concept, starting small and becoming big. Double, you work quite closely with the farmers on the ground. You see what their challenges are. What are some of the common challenges that women farmers face? I suppose the challenges that a small-scale farmer face versus a medium-scale commercial farmer is probably different. But in your experience, what are some of the common challenges that we see there? When you say challenges, farming is challenging to everybody. If I work for you, Duncan, I've only got you as a boss. I must keep you happy. And then I keep on getting my salary. As a farmer, I've got hundreds of diseases. I've got hundreds of pests. Then I've got the climate. Is it too hot? Is it too cold? Is it too wet? Is it too dry? And then you've even got your theft. So your challenges are enormous. But working with young women actually has its advantages. There's something about the commitment of these ladies that they have. I've mentored now for many, many years and worked on these programs, food security programs. And when they said to me, the young woman in farming, I said, Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> because it very seldom happens that I get to a piece of land and I've got to sit and wait for them to arrive, to come and work with the land or to meet and to assess the current situation on the fields. I'm normally the one that arrives and then they're there already. The farming starts at four o'clock when you're harvesting for the day and then you start tending the rest of the crops that you are sure you have a harvest for tomorrow. So I wouldn't say that the women have got more challenges. It's actually for me a better pleasure to work with a woman. And I'm not dissing the men. It's very fulfilling to work with a woman. What I would say is just the mothering nature. You know, you'd get somebody that comes down there and they've got six land with it and they want to buy a cabbage. And we make a deal that we say your crops cannot leave the year for under 80 rand a catch for wholesale because then they can resell it at 15 or to whatever price they want to do. And then the ladies would feel so bad that they'd sell it for six rand and then give another one for free. But that's humanity. And that is why it's so nurturing in agriculture. You've got to have a love for the soil. And I find that the ladies have an unbelievable love and relationship with the soil. Absolutely lovely. Bola, as you look towards phase three of the Women in Farming program, what are your hopes and aspirations for the future, for the business, personally as well, and the, the training enterprise? Expansion. For me, I think that's very important because in anything one does, they want to see growth and I think that's literally just me wanting to expand. I really would want to at least be able to do one minimum training per month. That's my aim right now. At least one training per month so that I get the experience, I get the hang of it, and I learn. And I want this to be a learning journey for me as well. So that is exactly what I'm planning on doing. Those are my goals right now. Another thing that I really want to enter is agro-processing. Already I've started processing with chopping cabbages, like how Tabu has explained, doing a dry version of a coleslaw and selling it, um, chopped spinach, 
But I really want to just enter the whole value chain to the point where I'm making sources myself using the produce that I am planted in my own garden. So that is exactly what I want. I just want to grow within the agricultural industry. Because one thing about agriculture, I realized that it's a very vast industry. When I started with agriculture, I thought it's just planting and selling. And then you realize there's so many things that you can do within the industry. So I just want to explore that. And I want personal growth. In fact, I've been signing up myself for classes. And the nicest thing about being part of this program is that they actually offer free courses. I'm really excited about that. Just gaining more knowledge, personally growing and more and more growth. Hopefully one day in Donkona Farming will be like the biggest supplier of some chili sauce and some cabbages. Oh, I can even have my own farmer's markets. You never know, you know. I want growth. That's all I ask for. If there's one farmer that I love, it is a future-focused farmer. And uh, you definitely come across to me as as a farmer that is future-focused, making plans for the future and seeing how you'll be able to run your business, not just five years from now, but 15, 30 years from now. And that's quite important. Of course, there was a funding element to this. Tell us how you utilize the funding that you received for your training enterprise and farming business at Fola. The most beautiful part about this whole uh, journey with Momentum is that they are very clear and specific as to you need to come and tell us what do you need. What I got were things that I definitely needed for my farm. For example, in KZN, we have a lot of hailstorms uh, recently. And so if you know spinach, it doesn't like it too much water. So having the tunnel put in was great because it saved me a lot of money. Usually, I lose harvest easily due to the hailstorm. So the tunnels help me. I have an irrigation system. Where I'm at, we have huge issues with water supply. So having, I think it's 5,000 liters, but it's a very big Georgia tank. I have the, one of the biggest Georgia tanks around my neighborhood where I can store that water because as much as it doesn't like too much water, it still needs water. That's the problem with agriculture. It's like one problem comes, another comes. Like you address one and another one comes. So the irrigation system was very helpful. And then with the training part or the training element, the screen where I showcase people printing, you know, when you're teaching, you need to have work materials that you hand out to people. So having a printer and not going to go to town and print for like five rent per page, and that saves me a lot. The laptop, you have to research materials, you have to compile materials. So for me, that has made it very easy for me to run my training without having to think about extra cost of hiring and stuff like that. As much as they funded me and I made profits, now I reinvested in my own business. So recently I just bought tables and chairs. So now I no longer hire tables and chairs when I do my trainings. I mean, I was so happy when I was fetching them, knowing that there's a funder that invested in my business for my business to grow. And I'm proud to say that I've made enough profit to then buy my own things. The funding elements has just done very well for me. And also, I work with other ladies within the industry. So we help each other because they also do training. So I would also like borrow her, my printer and stuff. A woman in farming, there's no like jealousy or something. It's all we work together. If you have, it means I also have. If I have, that means you also have. So the funding has not just impacted me, my business only. It has impacted other businesses indirectly. Absolutely. I think there's more women working with each other instead of against each other. That Your story seems to be an example of exactly just that. Tabo, we spoke earlier on the impact on not just the farmer and their business, but also the impact on the entire community. Share with us any success stories or achievements of the farmers you have mentored and what impact they have made on the communities uh, or the agricultural sector. To refer to the tunnels that Kola was speaking about, there was a need for tunnels because the KZN area has been inundated with hail, something that they're not used to. And the need was there for tunnels. But instead of just now ordering tunnels and having them erected, we approached it differently. We taught the ladies how to build their own tunnels and how to source different materials. With the erection of these tunnels, the community started seeing, but whoa, where did you get these tunnels? They said they built them. And we actually capacitated the ladies in also be able to diversify and 
selling that service. Oh, I can supply you with tunnels. I buy the materials and I come and erect them for you. So everything that we do, we do it through capacity, not just sourcing in and having it built. When you do the irrigation, we get the materials and we do the irrigation ourselves. So the ladies can then go and teach other people how to do irrigation or actually do it as a revenue stream, as an income to install irrigation. So this is all about the capacity, the capacity that the ladies are getting and then the confidence because they've done it on their own land. So in the case of Kola, for instance, her area where she's growing is also a learning site where she does her practicals. When she's training communities, they can come to her to do the practicals. I love the idea of her going into processing because if the community is growing a lot of tomatoes, you'll have at a stage at one time a whole lot of tomatoes becoming ripe. And when the market is saturated, sometimes it's very good to process them. And one of the things that we are looking at is dehydrated tomatoes, which is a thing. People don't understand how big the dehydrated tomatoes industry is. You only use fresh tomatoes when you're making a toaster sandwich or a burger or a salad. But for everything else, you are using dehydrated tomatoes. You do not put fresh tomato on a pizza, for instance. You use dehydrated tomatoes. If you're cooking stews, they use dehydrated tomatoes. And then also making the chutneys and the sauces that Tola is talking about. The community is seeing what's happening. All 10 of the businesses that I'm mentoring at the moment, they are inundated with people saying, but I also want to be able to do this. And although they are doing the trading right now for free, they've got the capacity now. And phase three is going to be focused on developing their capacity as trainers, presenters, and mentors for the future because they are leaders in the agricultural sector in the communities. They've got to get everybody to be food secure. And you do that by not growing food and then giving it to other people. You teach people to grow their own food. And if there's an abundance of food in Tebisweni, then it can be processed and sold off to other areas. If there's a shortage of food in Tebisweni, in the other areas where the ladies are growing, the communities can then supply there. And that is what food security is all about. Absolutely amazing. Are there any upcoming events or activities, uh, Tabo, that the women will be involved in? And how do these opportunities contribute to their growth and development? The ladies are doing their market days. They go to market days and sell some of their produce. But they are starting to brand themselves as trainers and mentors. And this is what we're doing for the next six months. And in the process, we will be inviting the funder to come and attend some of these events. And then also, very importantly, I've got to teach the ladies how to make money out of this because right now they just want to give everything away for free. And it's not sustainable because Tola's got costs to travel to, to get the deals. Then she's got to go and get the venue. Then she's got to train the people and then also give out materials. So there is a cost mechanism. And if she's going to do it for free, she's not going to be able to do it forever. So she's going to be borrowing from one to pay for another one. So in the process, Tola and the other ladies also, nearly all of them through the bank, also want to become trainers. This was something that actually came up from beginning of phase two, Red, because of the downtime you sometimes have in agriculture there, and also because the community are asking the whole time, please train us, please train us. KZN is very fortunate. You can have of the best qualified trainers. You get some trainers that will come and present, but they don't grow the vegetables themselves, but you see through them very quickly. These are ladies that for 18 months have been totally committed to the project. Events that are coming up have just been engaged by an entity which is more continentally based and they want to know how many people I can train per year. So I said, well, myself, I can train, let's say, 30 people over a period of 14 days. 14 days is two weeks, so you've got 26 times 30. But just remember, I've got 19 ladies that by June will be qualified trainers. They've got their passports, they can travel and they can do the quality of training and mentoring that I am doing. And the replication is what is going to reach. Also, we've been asked to assist with a foundation. They go out after a storm. If a roof has been blown off from a house, while they are fixing the roof, they want us to train them in gardens. And I said, yes, we can do that. In actual fact, the people will be harvesting before you finish building the roof. And they said, how is that possible? So I said, well, we have the skills to build a garden in one day, and you can start harvesting on the third day. And they said, this is impossible. So I showed them the video, and they were flabbergasted. When we do do that launch, we'd very much like to invite you to come and witness this because it goes against all things in agriculture. How do you build a garden on stone with a tunnel in one day and you start harvesting on the third day? But that's going to be the surprise that we're inviting you to. And of course, the ladies will be involved with this as well. And then a couple of other projects also in the pipeline that we are looking at and expanding. And then also hopefully to be able to reach other provinces as well. You definitely need to convince me how it's possible to plant on one day and three days later harvest. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that in action. 
Uh, Gola, can you share with us any recent collaborations or partnerships with uh, other industry experts or even organizations that have enriched your training programs or even expanded your network? I've worked with uh, HSRC. I've worked with PWC. I've worked with Agribusiness in Durban. I've worked with Asima Women. Currently collaborating with this lady. Currently, she's in Germany. We are supposed to be having a training session at the end of the month go very well. But I am collaborating. It's always best to work in a, with people and not try to be on your own, especially in this industry you want to grow. So I've got a lot in the pipeline. Trust me, you'll be writing another article about the history. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Any upcoming events or initiatives that you'd like to highlight or should be aware of? At month end, I shall be working with this lady doing crop production training. People must follow me on social media and Facebook at Domkona Farming, where all the details will be there. Tabo, we are currently within the rollout of phase three. What can we expect from you and the 10 businesses you are mentoring? Anything exciting or out of the ordinary? Phase three is in effect in a nutshell. It is what you have been doing in phase two, based on what you learned in phase one. Expand on that. And not just to increase the land that you're working on. Some of the ladies can't increase the land. I bought it. When we say expand, is look at other things. For instance, agri-services. One of the businesses is now going out and building gardens for NGOs and NPOs and schools and clinics. They've got that capacity now. They can also supply the tunnels and erect the tunnels themselves. They can also do the irrigation themselves. That is also part of the expansion. Also looking at agro-processing is also part of the expansion. The focus primarily is going to be in capacitating the ladies and getting them qualified as trainers and presenters and mentors. Not just to tick a box and say, okay, now you, you've got a laptop, you've got a screen and you've got a PowerPoint, but to have them accredited as trainers so that they can go out and take it to the next level. In that way, also expand their capacity themselves, not just through this program, but they will also be doing it. And what I love about how the ladies have grown in the 18 months is that they've allowed me to grow with them. There are certain things also that when they came to me with an idea, I'd look at it and say, ah, I can't see this working. And really, they actually proved me wrong. They made it work. I'm on just as much committed to this journey. It's a mutual thing. We, we're both learning in the process. And I'm building my confidence now to actually contemplate taking this throughout Africa. Absolutely amazing. You've given us a glimpse of where you see these women farmers growing to in the future. Tabo, as you look towards that future... What are your hopes and aspirations for the women farmers you mentor? And how do you see them contributing to the agricultural landscape in the long term? I'm hoping that they will employ me. (laughs) Hopefully that's the case. (laughs) I want them to become so good that I can sit back and say, you see those ladies, I had a share in their success. You know, the relationship at the end of this phase, the project comes to a, a natural end, a closure. My relationship with all the ladies is going to continue because there were times also when the going was tough. We stuck together irrespective of the challenges. There was a time where I was not able to visit KZN. I made a plan out of my own to say, okay, but I'm going through. I'm going through even if it's at my own expense. And some of the ladies actually saved up some money that they'll put the diesel. I must come through, please. The relationships we have built are rock solid and it's forever. It's not just based on this project. If this project does not continue, the relationships will carry on. That was Tabo Ulifir, a food security specialist who mentored cohort one of the Women in the Women in Farming program and Kola Sabisi, founder of Ntombi Corner Farming. You can, of course, read more on this topic by visiting www.foodformzanzi.co.za. That's a wrap from Zanzi, but before I let you go, South Africa's brightest young agricultural minds will converge at the Mzanzi Young Farmers in Dava, seeking answers to pressing questions while forging connections to propel their ventures forward, and you are invited. That's right, join us in Pretoria North from Thursday 4 to Saturday 6 April for Africa's prominent gathering of young farmers and agripreneurs Tickets are currently on sale and you can secure your seat by visiting www.farmingindaba.com through Quicket 
or purchase your tickets at Pick and Pay, Pick and Play Clothing, or Pick and Pay Liquor Stores nationwide. And of course, as always, remember to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so you never miss any of the episodes. From me, Duncan Masiwa, our technical producer, Megan van der Vind, and the rest of Hashtag Team Food from Zanzi, thanks for listening. Life in South Africa can be a lot. I mean, scroll through Twitter for a minute and tell me I'm wrong. Thank God for South Africans though, right? We're inspiring, and even on the bad days, we fight back with a smile. That's why I love Food Form Zanzi so much. They're not ashamed to celebrate the ordinary unsung heroes who work every day to put food on our nation's tables. Go to foodformzanzi.co.za and never miss an inspiring story.